everybody, and welcome back to yes another episode of hopefully your favourite golf rules questions podcast in the planet. It's definitely should be your favourite golf rules questions podcast in Australia. Thanks for joining us once again. I am ably joined uh, this time virtually. We're not side by side. It was a very pleasure and a privilege to be side by side. The great golf rules master and guru himself, Blakey. Welcome back to the Golf Rules Questions podcast. I always feel funny welcoming back to your own podcast where I just sit here and press the buttons. How are you, young man? Yeah, going well. Morning, uh, Roscoe. Morning, all. Uh, it's yeah another episode, episode 26. Never thought we'd sort of get up to this stage, but it uh, keeps rolling on. Unfortunately, no golf getting played today, but that was a lot of fun last week. And I see that you've got it. Uh, well, I won't mention it, but um, on your hat, at least. I'll mention that. It's on your hat. Don't give too many clues away already for the background <laughs> bingo, but uh, you've pretty much <laughs> pretty much given it away uh, for the one. <laughs> you've given it away for the one person that actually enjoys this segment called background bingo. Uh, I'll just say a quick good day to Andrew Miller. I also want to say a good day to Macca, who uh, I bumped into yesterday. So that's why I was a little bit confused with the uh, the, the, the the listeners. Macca, good day to you. Andrew Miller, good day to you. Blakey's already pretty much given the game away. I want all the detail you can give us on uh, this uh, course and hole. So there's a bit of a project for you if you are playing. Background bingo, it's a great little thing. If you don't know what we're talking about because you're joining the Golf Rules Questions podcast for the first time, well, firstly, welcome. And uh, secondly, background bingo is where you can go over to the YouTube channel and look at this video that we put, which is just essentially the Zoom and Blakey puts, uh, jazzes it up a little bit and makes it fabulous. And... Uh, we have these golf holes on the background and your challenge is to have a look at the golf holes. And if you're interested in quirky golf pictures that we may have taken, or we may have borrowed from other photographers around the globe. Uh, this one is one of my photos. I don't know about yours, Blakey, but uh, you can tell us where they are. And, uh, and one day we'll have a, a prize because one day someone might want to sponsor background bingo, but we need probably two or three more people to play it first, Blakey. But uh, anyway, what are we talking about this week? We've got all of the regular segments. We've got our, golf rules question of the week which is otherwise known as the grqotw grqotw we like a little bit of an abbreviation uh here so we will cap off what the answer is to last week's uh grqotw uh, and clarify one point which I, which I do want to backtrack on and clarify uh, because it was a question that i raised last week and a question that i had clarified from the uh superintendent slash greenkeeping slash groundspeople fraternity. So I will cover that back off with you, Blakey. Uh, we've got a listener question from uh, a young lady who sits across the other side of the Pacific Ocean on West Coast USA, who does a wonderful job in the world of golf rules uh, in her own right. She does a wonderful job in educating uh, ladies and women into the game of golf and making them feel welcome and comfortable. Uh, that's Marcella from Girlfriend's Guide to Golf. So we've got a question from Marcella. We have uh, a little bit of discussion around that. Um, and then this week's golf rules question. So a fairly concise episode this week, Blakey, no Ivers to report. Any Ivers to report? Did we get called on any, any Ivers? Uh, not for a while, but I'm sure uh, I'm sure there'll be just one around the corner. Well, there, oh, uh, did you? I think that was an Iver of me getting our, you know, one or two uh, listeners that uh, to participate in, in the uh, competitions uh, mixed up this morning. So, but anyway, good. good that, that's all right. Andrew and Andrew. You didn't happen to see the European tour last week, did you? I saw bits and pieces of the European tour last week. Did you see the one that was sort of a viral photo with the divot and the ball? Mm. Okay, okay. So there was a ball in the fairway that rolled up right beside a, loose impediment a divot that had been taken out of the ground by someone else and not replaced uh, and the interesting thing about it was it was one of your favorite players uh that the who owned the ball that rolled up beside the divot um i was think that the one where the divot was sitting on top of the ball or just yeah basically yeah, yeah 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 it was your mate george oh george campillo or, or as as um as Ivor himself would say, uh, Jorge, Jorge Campillo. Yep. So I I just go and buy George Georgie Campillo. Uh, hashtag George Campillo Watch or Campillo Watch. I I started that hashtag uh, last year after, but essentially just to backfill the information there for the listeners playing with uh, George or Jorge at um, 
the Vic Open Pro-Am a couple of years ago. And suffice to say, George didn't give his playing partners a lot, a little bit. Uh, there was, wasn't was really a language barrier. He's, he and his caddy, uh, Borja, um, spoke perfect English, but they just didn't give us a lot. And uh, subsequently to that, I was fascinated by George Campillo and I uh, started to watch him and he had some great moments that I would uh, record on my camera when I was watching the European tour late at night. Some not so great moments, which I would record on the camera and I would post them and put hashtag Campillo watch. The people that know the story had a little bit of a chuckle with that, meant nothing. But um, the big news about that, after playing, <laughs> after that round, he went on to win for the first time on the European tour after 16 years on the European tour. He won on the European tour after playing with me. So there's trivia. Well, I didn't win anything on the European tour after playing with you last week. So uh, I'm you're, still, you're a winner anyway. Anyway, let's, let's get back on track. Um, so what happened? Anyway, back to the pivot on the ball. Yeah. So I posted this one on Instagram and Facebook. Um, the player could obviously move the loose impediment, uh, but if they cause their ball to move, they get the penalty of one shot. Uh, Jorge did try and move the loose impediment, but luckily for him, he took the gamble and the ball didn't move. So there was no penalty and he got to play the ball without the big divot on top of it. Mm. Divots on golf courses. It's an often talked about uh, topic. It was one of the topics that was widely discussed in the 2019 uh, amendments and adjustments to the to the rules. A lot of call for uh, free relief from uh, balls and divots, but it just and I think we've discussed this before. It just really becomes too much of a, a question mark over what is a divot, what is a repaired divot, what is a repairing divot. So. You know, it, it's just you can go through the Twitter sphere and, and go down a rabbit hole of so much debate around that topic. But basically, your ball's in a divot. Uh, play it as it lies. Play it as you find it. And there's no relief from that. But in this case, if your ball is under a divot, well, then it's a loose impediment. And it shouldn't be there because the caddy should replace that divot uh, in that particular tournament environment. Caddy, caddy should replace it and chop it in. I'm sure that there's, uh, and you can tell us, Blake, there's probably should have been a team of people, but maybe not in this COVID environment, the teams of people that sweep the field, or the course, sorry, um, at tournaments and replace divots and do all that sort of stuff aren't as prevalent. So maybe that's one of the excuses that we'll hand over to the European Tour for not doing that. But really the caddy should have picked up that divot and put it back in the, the stamped it in the ground. Yeah, well, it might have even been from a group that just played like, one or two groups of, uh, ahead. So someone should, have, someone should have filled it in nonetheless. I, I'd, I'd say that, uh, you know, even though it's COVID environment, uh, you can keep 1.5 meters away from each other. Uh, well, the, the green keepers can uh, when they're replacing divots. So they more than likely would have done it. But I would uh, assume that it was a caddy and player that didn't replace it from a group prior. Well, good luck to uh, George Campilla this year on the European Tour. He uh, he's played. He play, actually plays pretty well. He's a, he was a lovely fellow. Didn't give us too much, but uh, good luck to you, George. And uh, you had some reasonable results in the time since uh, we met. And uh, I love watching uh, watching you and uh, your wonderful bouffant bouffant of hair. One of the greatest uh, outside of Robbie Rock. George Campilla probably has the greatest bouffant of hair on tour. Uh, I might reach out to a couple of tall people and clarify that, but he's got a great bouffant of hair, big hat, no badge on the front of the hat. Uh, Callaway player now, but anyway, there you go. Uh, m m let's keep moving on. This week, uh, last week's golf rules question of the week was: Do you get free relief from the spray of an, as you term it, irrigator? Do you get free relief from the spray of an irrigator? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, Tim. Some might say uh, it's temporary water, but that's not quite true. Uh, it's temporary water only when it's on the ground, on the surface of the golf course. So there is no free relief from the spray. Uh, just like if it was raining, you don't get a free relief if it starts raining. Uh, but a committee could well, they, they should be made aware and then turn the sprinklers off. Uh, but they, they could make a local rule 
uh, if it was really prevalent. Uh, but it would just be easier just to turn it off. Otherwise, you just have to try and avoid it. Maybe when it's, um, you know, not going to hit your ball, go and hit the ball really quickly and then move on. Well, current times, most uh, irrigation systems are automated. They pop up out of the ground. You have very little ability to influence them. But back in my day when we were kids, you know, it was back to that old... Uh, you know, it's not like that. You know, you you young folk of the uh, disco world made it into a little bit of a dance. You know, tsh, tsh, tsh. you had the irrig yeah, irrigators. I call them a sprinkler, and I'll come back to that. But it was a sprinkler, and you just moved it out of the way, or someone held. Uh, it. They put, yeah, they put, they put their club down, and the and the old sprinkler head that went. You just held it back, and it sprayed over the other way, and then on you went. You can do that. Yeah, you're you're okay to do that on the courses that still have hoses, out of you know pipe points beside and on the fairways and all that, you're allowed to move it around, aren't you? Well, you know, we, you and I did a video on hoses and whether they're immovable obstructions or movable obstructions, and most likely they'll be movable as the default, but a greenkeeping team, the committee, may want them to be immovable because they don't want um, golfers moving them into the rough and watering the rough instead of the fairway type thing. Because there's one thing that golfers are really good at, and that is moving something out of the way and not putting it back, which is not a good thing. Okay, there you go. So in most cases, they will be immovable obstructions, meaning you're not permitted to move them. Okay, and I did, uh, as you saw, have it clarified that one of the greens team at uh, one of the royal courses not in victoria but in maybe the australian capital territory did confirm that it is a sprinkler uh yeah i had a few tell me that it was a sprinkler i was like oh i was thinking uh what to say uh, it's a sprinkler and it's an irrigation system should we move on to uh marcella's uh question david yes let's go Hi, Blakey and Roscoe. This is Marcella. Love your podcast. I'm obsessed with it. Hey, my question today is, if you are playing at a club, country club or your golf club, and you are playing in a competition and it is stroke play, and you're in a foursome where someone takes a drop or maybe a drop for a stake tree or something that everyone sort of assumes is a rule, and they find out later, maybe in a conversation, after scorecards have been turned in, they find out, or at least one of the players finds out later, that what was done was actually not permitted under the rules. What happens then? Look forward to hearing from you. Thanks. Yeah, good question, that one. It was. Uh, I don't know how often that happens, but I'm sure that it's... Uh you know, in various scenarios being discussed afterwards and then it pops up that that might have been a rule infringement, that scenario that in that case, a particular person had recounted. Um, and then you realise that, you have this realisation of what's going on. What do you do? Yeah, I mean, it's more likely that it will happen like a week later. Oh, I didn't realise you couldn't do that. I did that on the weekend um, rather than happening while you're having a drink around the bar. But then again... You know, oh, on the fifth hole, I took this drop and then I hit it on the green. I made such a great par. What do you mean you took a drop? Um, so if you take a drop into a wrong spot and you don't realize this, and in stroke play we're talking about, and then you sign your card, you hand it in, you know, you're happy with the score, your marker's happy with the score, and then you find out that you shouldn't have taken that drop. So you've dropped it, say for free, and you've dropped it into a wrong place. Uh, then you've played from a wrong place. And uh, that's a two shot penalty and you have to add that two shot penalty to your score. Uh, that is if the competition hasn't been closed yet. Okay, so Roscoe finds a bit of, uh, dirt on the uh, bit of dirt, uh, an embedded stone in the middle of the fairway. And he thinks, oh yeah, I get free relief from this embedded stone. So you take your free relief, 
you drop it in a wrong spot, you play from the wrong spot, and you have to add that penalty of uh, dropping it into, and playing from a wrong spot to your score. So you, your 74 goes to a 76, but the competition's already closed, then it stays as a 74 and there's no uh, penalty to you because uh, it wasn't found before the competition's closed. Now, if you did it deliberately, you knew that there wasn't free relief, but you're like, ah, oh, stuff that stone, it should be a free relief. That's a disqualification penalty. Mm -hmm. It's not add, add the penalty after you uh, hand it in your card. That's just disqualification, uh, regardless of whether the competition's closed. Okay, so what is it, you know, I guess what's the real message in, in that question, uh, the outtake of it, you know, so obviously if it happens, if the competition's still open, you can go back to the uh, scoring hut, the pro shop, the whatever it is, and say, oh, look, guys, I think we had this situ situation. These days they can go straight into the system and, and just adjust it. Or do I just... No, you'd be disqualified, wouldn't you? You've handed in the wrong card, sorry. They can, uh, no, no. You, if you you've handed in the wrong score yeah. and you didn't know that you were to incur a penalty, mm -hmm. you just add the penalty. Add, add the penalty, as you just described. Um, but if it's closed, then you've just got to learn from that and, and move on and, and sort of suck it up, right? Would you accept a, uh, accept a trophy? This is the hard thing. This is the point. Yeah, this is what I'm trying to get to is, is what happens if, and it, and it might, may be the case that a newer golfer playing off a higher handicap, you know, has 45 points, you know, and, and you see, you know, the higher handicap golfers come in with their, you know, best round of the year, 45 points. They win the competition. What would, what would happen? What would you do? How would you feel? Uh, it's an interesting, interesting situation. I mean, to be honest, and, you know, I'm all about the rules, but if a 45 handicapper didn't know the rule, ended up winning a competition, then found out the rule, I I wouldn't be that disappointed. I mean, it's not that easy to learn the rules. Um, you know, there's a difference between actually deliberately cheating the system and just not knowing and and hopefully they'd learn from it but uh yeah you know i hope that those beginner golfers are playing with people that know the rules and can teach them yeah well it's an interesting you know, point i'm not sure how often you know that comes up obviously marcella has faced that situation or a part of her uh, network has faced that situation it's something that she's been asked um, you know, if it does, does happen in your you know, golfing environment and, you know, the example of Blakey decides that it is a higher handicap, which is probably, you know, I'm, I'm, I am, we are guessing, but the more likely scenario that it, something like that is going to happen. Well, of course, if you've changed it, you can get it changed. If the competition is closed and it stands, it stands. If someone competition closes, it stands and someone wins the tro a trophy, a, a trophy, a voucher or, or something like that. And it really is, um, you know, an education uh, purpose and piece for that person to, to learn from. Uh, I would hope that, you know, in the example that we're using, if they're a higher handicapper, that they're not made a made a, uh, a an example of. But I guess, you know, it just comes back to that point about the importance of when you enter the game and you enter competitions and you you are playing for score, uh, the the value of spending some time educating yourself and being educated on the passion of the project that you're so passionate about and the rules of golf, uh, David, that's why, why we're doing this in, uh, and why we're doing this is to try and, you know, as you can tell from, from me, when I try and replay these situations in my head, there's always something that I'm learning, that, you know, and when I repeat it back to you, you know, I'm trying to just remember that. So I, I learn all these situations and, you know, hopefully the people are no different that listen. And if you know someone that is uh, new to the game that, you know, may listen to a podcast, just share this with them. And if they want to reach out to, to Blake and they have a question, he'll always answer. Uh, if they want to get on the newsletter, he'll always, you know, send out all the different bits of pieces of information that uh, he compiles. So am I speaking out of turn there, uh, David? No, that's, 
exactly right and what i found is i could uh we could go in here and we can explain it i can explain it on youtube i explain it in instagram but i still want those questions because some everyone learns differently yeah so you know don't don't just sort of go oh well he's he's explained it but i don't quite i still don't quite understand it reach out uh, because I'm happy to talk. I could talk about the rules of golf for uh, seven hours straight. So there you go. He's like the uh, the big friendly rules guru that is open 24-7. All the people around the world, just 24-7, message him in. Might not get back to you straight away, but message uh, Blakey and uh, he will do his best, level best to uh, to get back to you and give you the information that you need. That's one of the reasons and areas why we first connected all that time ago, that story that I recount sitting in Glasgow airport, posted something and then bang, you're straight on and uh, clarified the situation. And the 26 odd thousand people have viewed that uh, video of mine of some of a uh, young chap playing out of the burn um, were educated about that particular scenario, which clearly was a scenario that people didn't really fully, many people didn't really fully uh, understand at that time. So there you go. I reckon I've reposted that one about three times, Roscoe. Yeah. And so I'd I'd say um, at least four hundred thousand people have viewed that video. Really, a young man, a young man from Geelong playing out of uh, a burn at Dundonald Links, a great shot, but he actually broke the rules as you identified for us at that time, which is actually no longer uh, breaking the rules. There you go. That's right. Now, advice. This is another topic that you want, we wanted to talk about today. What is and what are you permitted to give out and receive for free? Is that a question from Brett Williamson? Yes. Yeah, Brett Williamson wanted uh, just through, through the email, which we just said, anyone can uh, fire an email to me and we'll, we'll get the answer out on the, on the air. And Brett Williamson just wanted some clarification about advice. Um, this, this story goes. One. This is this is actually you you you, know, you might you might not you might know the answer already, but it's a good one because it. I think this is another one that happens more often than than we care to uh, consider, and uh, whether it's intentional, whether it's the, um, I'm not sure of the word that I'm looking for, but intentional and therefore you know not in the spirit of the game. You mean, it, you mean malice with malice? Yes, uh, or it's accidental. I think it happens more often in a in a weekend sort of club golfer type environment than you would care con- to consider. But anyway, in, I'll get back to you. In my humble opinion, this would be the most broken rule in club golf. Okay, well we we, we concur, and we hadn't pre-discussed uh, you know how we both felt about that. It just comes out, but um, yeah, I, I think it's that scenario as well. I mean, you know, playing social golf the other day. Uh, what'd you hit there? What'd you hit there? Is that going to help the person? Yes, it is. Um, is it going to help when a two handicapper tells a 45 handicapper what club they hit? Probably not. Is it going to help when a 45 handicapper tells a two handicapper what club they hit? Probably not, but it could still have some influence. If the two handicapper was to say, I, I hit it a five iron, so it goes low under the wind. Uh, and the 45 handicap is going, hmm, yeah, that 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 does make more sense than me trying to smash a seven iron or something like that. Uh, there you go. There's there's advice. I mean, these are conversations that you can have on the golf course when there is no when it's not going to impact the next stroke, but. If it's going to impact the next stroke, say we're both sit there, standing on a par three um, green, no, sorry, par three T, and working out what club to play. Uh, if it's going to have an impact that you, it's going to influence, and that's a really important word, it's going to influence what club you're about to hit, then uh, that is considered advice. Mm. What I'll just tell you what's not considered advice. Uh, the location of things on the course, such as the hole, the putting green, the fairway, penalty areas, bunkers, or another player's ball, the distance from one point to another, or the rules. So if I was to say, you know, you're you're in that bunker behind you, Roscoe, 
which I was. And I say, and I say to you, well, if you don't want to play it out of the bunker, you can take a drop within the bunk. You know, you can take a drop within the bunker. If you don't play, want to play it from that spot, you can take a drop within the bunker for one penalty. Uh, on a couple of options, you can go back to your last place played, which was at the tee because you boomed that drive. Uh, or you can take a drop outside the bunker for a two-stroke penalty under nineteen point two. Mm-hmm. Uh, nineteen point three. Oh, I'm going to get that one wrong. Um, so that's giving you information about the rules. That's not influencing. The difference would be if I said, "Well, I saw your bunker play on the last hole, and it is horrific." I, if I were you, I would definitely take a drop outside the bunker. Uh, for the two shots. Now you're starting to influence the player and what decision they should make. Equally, if it's a new golfer, a, you know, like a newer golfer and, and they don't really fully appreciate the difference between a pitching wedge and a lob wedge or a 56 degree and you walked up and said, hey, uh, Bill, I noticed you've got your pitching wedge there. Why don't you just go with that more lofted 60 degree and that'll help you get out better. That would be an example of influencing the outcome of that particular player's um, shot. Spot on. H- how about you open the face a little bit more? Otherwise, it's just not going to get out. That's right. Yeah. So um, what about the, uh, the scenario that you probably sometimes see on tour or maybe you don't see as much on tour because they don't really focus on it in the coverage. But I think that the caddies um, share information to each other about what clubs have been hit or, or the players, you know, openly uh, look in the other players bag to see what club they're hitting. Okay. That's a really good query. Are you allowed to look in someone else's bag to see what club they've chosen? Yes. Hmm. Yes, you are. Uh, If you've got a club out and I just walk over and see that you've got a, a six iron because the six iron isn't in your bag, then that's fine. I can go, okay, that's information that I've learned through my own actions, not actions of me asking you what you've chosen to hit. Uh, however, there can no, there is not permitted to be any physical movement of your equipment or anything to try and find out that information. So if you draped your towel over your bag and I lifted your towel to find out what club you'd hit, uh, that would be, I would incur a penalty that way. So what about if you're standing there on the tee waiting to, sh- to hit and your playing partner has a nice new set of whatever brand of clubs and you go, wow, they look really nice. Can I just have a look at these new clubs? And he goes, yeah, have a look at them. They're brand new. How, you know, awesome. And your intention really is to see that he's hitting an eight iron or a nine iron. Well, bang, straight away. What's my first question? What's your intention, Ross? Oh, in my mind, yeah. Well, not my mind. In the example's mind, yeah. I'm trying to hit. I'm trying to find out if he's hitting eight, eight or nine iron, but I haven't uh, realized that. that. That's the penalty. That's uh, you know. It. I know that. Well, it's all. It's all with, within someone's head. How can you tell if the what their intention is? We can't. You know, there are going to be some people that break the rules. That there are going to be some people that have very. Um, you know, their integrity is constantly questioned. And, you know, we know some people, uh, you probably know some people like that. You probably see some people out on the tour like that. And that's, you know, that follows them. You know, being a, being a cheater uh, follows you around and it's probably one of the worst tags you can ever have being a cheater in golf because it's so easy not to cheat. You know what one of the most creative uh, things that I've heard in a playing group? Go for it. Someone asked their mate, what time did they arrive at the golf course this morning? Oh, yeah, the old 7 a.m., 7 iron. Yeah, exactly. So uh, my friends used to joke... But it didn't really, it didn't really, uh, well, it did matter. It was in pennant. But a couple of them used to work at a pizza shop. And, you know, number one on the menu of the pizza shop was Capricciosa. I think that's right. Number two was Margarita. Number three was 
Aussie barbecue, four was chicken, five was Hawaiian, six was blah, 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 seven, I could keep going. Yeah. And so they go, oh, what are you having for dinner tonight? Oh, I'm having a Hawaiian. Really? That's classic. Yeah. Is there a but <laughs> this is, you know, it, it's, it's again, it's, it's cheating. Mm. Um, they joked about it. Yeah. Whether and, they and put it in play, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, that, that, that's why it's my personal opinion is that does it really matter if you tell someone what iron you're going to use? Um, that's my personal opinion. That is not the rules. It's against the rules. Do I break the rules on this one? No, I, it's, I don't care. My sorry, I was going to say, you know, we, we I get it, but you know, when you're playing socially and this sort of questioning starts to happen, as it probably did last week, you know, when we were playing a new course for the first time, are you cool with that? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we're playing socially. We're not, yeah. We didn't play. We didn't hand in a card. We weren't handing in a card for handicapping. We weren't playing in the competition. It's social. It doesn't matter what you talk about when you're playing socially. Uh, I'm just talking about when you're actually playing, you know, your handicap, your competition. No, I, I know that doesn't doesn't matter, but, I, you know, like, yeah, you are the man with the highest integrity of rules in, in the land that I know. And I, just, I was just wondering if, if you just, you know, just as a matter of course, stick with that concept at all times of play. And, uh, and we didn't talk about it last week, and I can't really remember you asking me or me asking you. It probably happened. I can't remember. But uh, I, just, I was just wondering if, if it's something that you were sticking by in social play or competition play as a matter of course and habit rather than just being cool with it in social play, which you obviously are because you just said that, versus, you know, switching into competition mode, which you obviously are because you have to and we all have to. And I was just trying to get a handle on that. What you'll find is certainly with competition, I would, and I cringe when people ask. I, I usually don't. I point out that the rule is that if you ask and it's going to influence your play, uh, then you know you're going to get the penalty. I don't usually penalise people. Um, I'm a bit soft that way. In social golf, you'll never find me asking what club you're going to hit. Yeah. Uh, but if you ask me, I'm happy to tell you which means we both breach the rule in, in actual competition play because you have asked and I've given you the information. Yeah. Um, but you'll never, yeah, I, I just don't, I don't get that much information from other people, what club they use. So you sort of, you know, you could, I mean, you could hit a five iron really, really smooth on a 145 meter shot or you could try and pump a nine iron there, you know, it's, and you could fat a five iron and just roll it up and you could skinny a, a nine iron or, you know what it is. So just, there's so many more factors than just what the number of the club is that I just don't really think it has a true influence, but some people it's like, they've always done it. And it's like a traditional thing that, um habit. yeah it's it is it's habit and it doesn't really influence them because they really know what they're going to use but they just seem to go oh you know oh, what club are you using you know if i if they pull some people already have got the club out of their in their hand and then they go oh what club are you using like how is that going to influence what you're using if you've already got the club sort of thing uh you know the only way that it would influence me is negatively because it just yeah <laughs> another thought in my mind that I don't want to think about. I don't want to have questions about what someone else is doing. Reg I just want to decide on what I'm doing and stick to the thought, the first, usually the first thought that I'm thinking about that particular shot in the club. I only want to think about that. So I'm absolutely very happy not to know. Uh, I probably don't go looking in other people's bags because I just decide, go with it and try and execute it. Sometimes it works. That, that sounds... Fun. That sounds like me. I I don't need to know someone at what else is someone else is using. So, um, you know, until my eyes get really bad and I aren't able to see the flag or something. Well, as you can see by my glasses on this video, my new year and Klopp style glasses, uh, my eyes are deteriorating in my age. But uh, there we go. Oh yeah, how how are Liverpool going this morning? I don't care. I don't know. I don't care. I hope they get beat. <laughs> no, I I retract that. If anyone is a listener who's a Liverpool fan, and there are many, um, I am a fan of a number of Liverpool players. Andy Robertson, I think, is uh, one of Scotland's greatest ever players at the current time. Um, but 
you know, in all honesty, um, in integrity, in terms of Liverpool's results, I do not really care too much. All right, let's get back to advice. So uh, I just want to say as well, uh, bad advice still counts as advice. <laughs> so if you, if someone asks you what club you are going to use, obviously yeah. they're going to get the penalty. Uh, and you say, I'm using a three iron when you're using an eight iron to try and deliberately put them off, uh, you'd still get the penalty um, because you're trying to influence their play. Uh, and so, yeah, you'd still get the breach. So both, both of you get a breach or the asker and the, and the giver? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're, if you're the asker, you're trying to seek advice. Yep. And if you're the, give, uh, the giver, uh, you're trying to give advice. So it doesn't matter that you've been asked, you haven't offered up the information. Yep. Um, it just matters that you are trying to give information. You're both complicit in the rules crime. There we go. Um, That's nice. I, I like that. You're both, I can hear if you are listening to, sorry, if you get this far and you are listening to this, obviously you are listening to us and please stick with us. We're nearly at the end, but uh, the little bit of noise that you can hear in the background, it's actually um, summer in Melbourne still uh, for us in the Southern Hemisphere, but it's uh, a little bit, might surprise you, raining today and it's a little bit of rain. It's quite heavy that you can hear on the outside. Um, Let's, uh, Brett Williamson, thank you for your question. Really do appreciate that and hope that uh, a roundabout discussion leads you to the point of you can't give advice and you can't receive advice. There we go. The, the, I'll just finish it off. Oh, I sorry. guess the main thing is, is it going, and this is the main question you ask, is it going to influence the next shot? So if you ask the question and look, seeking information, is that information going to influence your next shot? If you give information, is that information going to influence the person's next shot? But also remembering that the rules, distance from one point to another and the location of things on the course don't count as um, that under that advice. Yeah. To clarify, well done, thank you. So thank okay, you for again. Thanks, Brett. Okay, this week's GRQATW, for episode 26. It's a long one. And in the tradition of the question, I will try and read it. Is that okay, Blakey? Uh, yes, I prefer that you read it. And I would prefer that you read it in your Scottish accent, but you didn't do it last week. No, and I won't do it again. I'll save that. I need, I need to practice. I had to listen back to that. And it probably wasn't my finest attempt at a Scottish accent. I thought it was great. But uh, it, it's, it's interesting because it was my natural accent as a kid, uh, even though I was born here in Australia, but I did speak with a Scottish accent uh, as a kid going to school in Cessnock, New South Wales. And as you can imagine, if you're familiar with that part of the world, it's a beautiful part of the world, uh, Hunter Valley wine region, uh, very, very popular area, great golf courses up there. Everyone should go there if you are in New South Wales and, and wanting to spread a bit of uh, love up that way. But it was a pretty, pretty, uh, you know, working class environment up there. You have a good rugby league town. The Johns brothers are from Cessnock. And you can imagine a little kid with a Scottish accent turning up to uh, kindergarten uh, and I still remember, I still remember in Australia being ridiculed for that. So, um, hence the Australian accent that I got now, mate. Um, haven't lost a Pro V1 lately either. There you go. Just uh, by the way. Uh, so let's get back to the question. Uh, in, in stroke play, the balls of player A and player B are in different bunkers on opposite sides of the green. Unbeknown to each other, both players play their next stroke from within the bunkers and the balls whilst in motion on the green, hit each other. With player C standing on the green watching closely, both balls come to rest on the putting green only 10 centimetres from where they hit each other. What happens next? Okay, so the important thing here is two players are playing, Roscoe and Blakey. They can't see each other. They just assume that it's their turn. They hit their balls under the green and the balls end up hitting each other and player C is watching, um, watching this whole thing uh, happen. So what happens next? What do you do? That is a good question. It's not a scenario that I've ever been faced with, but it is a, when, you, when you talk about it and simplify that, because it was a long question and it's, uh, that version that you just accounted for there probably explains it very, very clearly, uh, rather than my trying to um, radio voice uh, read it. But I've never faced that at all, but I'm intrigued by that. I don't know the exact answer. 
Uh, we shall find out next week. Very good. Is that all we need to cover today, Blakey? Is there anything else that you want to advise? Instruct- well, I guess I guess my either was the fact that I called a sprinkler an irrigator. Oh, well, you know. Um, but uh, I'm forever going to call an irrigator from now on. No, and fair enough. And you can call it whatever you want because it's your show. I just, uh, I'm just the brother of the greenkeeper of, uh, of the duo here. Uh, uh, we have greenkeeping in the family. And uh, young Mitchell Driver up there at Royal Canberra, he was uh, kind enough to chirp out to me and say, it's a sprinkler, mate. So um, there we go. It's, all, it's, it's just a bit of fun, Blake. There's no harm, no foul here. Absolutely. Absolutely. As, as if I took it seriously. You sounded very serious. Sir. It sounded like you're, I offended you by calling you on that. That's, that's pretty hard to do. Okay. All right. Well, with the uh, highest of intent, integrity, and honor, let's sign off for this podcast episode. Oh, are we going to do background bingo? I mean, you've half oh. done your one. No, you you half gave it away. <laughs> we gave it away. Thanks very much for reminding me. Uh, I've got a hat on. If you can zoom in and see the hat, well, that probably tells you where it is. Uh, the, the question is, what does this hole take from? Where does this? Where does the design of this hole come from? Is that what you're going to ask? As we may have alluded to last week when we were on the boat uh, on the way across uh, Port Phillip Bay, courtesy, oh, no, there was no courtesy. We, it was the very um, expensive uh, ferry ride across there. Um, what was that? What were you doing there? Isn't that like money? Yeah, money? it was a lot of kabulis to get a ferry across there, but uh, it's a very enjoyable way of getting across the bay. Don't worry about that. Um, we talked about template holes. And uh, this particular green uh, complex and bunker and essentially everything around the complex, not just the green and the bunker, is a, is a design that has now become a template. You'll see this green condition, uh, green, I guess, design and bunker placement, bunker style featuring on a, on a handful of courses around the world where the good architects draw from architectural style, which is basically what architecture does. It takes from style from the past and, and reinterprets it into a modern uh, version. I love seeing uh, these reinterpretations in new designed and newly made golf courses. Uh, one of the benefits of getting good quality architects in to do redos at Lonsdale Links, that's what they've done with the OCM team. And they've implemented a number of template holes taken from you know, the classic template holes from Year has gone by with the classic architects, you know, going right back to Tom Morris. And this one is a, you know, Tom Morris, I guess, Mother Nature slash Tom Morris inspired uh, design. So tell us what that is. There's, we're probably giving you way, way, way too many hits. You know, the hat, the bunker, Tom Morris. I think uh, it's a no brainer from there. But uh, we'd love your feedback on that. And your uh, background bingo there, Blakey? Uh- you know, I almost think that we've already had this one on, but uh, we've definitely had this. I may, compl- have, had that, I may have had that one on. I think. Yeah, I, I think I think you might have. Uh, a good friend of the podcast, Stuart McPhee, who assists me with my YouTube videos. Uh, he played there uh, last week, so if you can name the golf course in the hole, um, yeah, go for it. And and. To your, you know, Andrew Miller is an absolute gun at this. Uh, but we do have some other people that like playing background bingo. Whenever it's in New Zealand, my dad loves playing. And I have had calls for us to branch outside of the Southern Hemisphere, although you go Northern Hemisphere, but get over to the big piece of land that is the US. Um, and I'm sure we will get over there one day soon because there's many, many golf courses over there. Macca, Andrew, Mr. Blake, Mr. Flanagan. Uh, who else we got? Webbo. Mr. Mr. Webbo, Mr. Williamson, Willow. You can Brett Williamson, Fraser. Willow, Fraser. Uh, the handful of listeners that do join us every week. Thank you. For the listeners that haven't rated a mention here, not rated a mention, that's a wrong term, but haven't gained a mention here because we don't know your name, but we do thank you for listening. And uh, we hope you listen and join us again next week. Share this, like this, subscribe, do all those wonderful things that help this podcast get in the ears of other people. That's all we can ask. Blakey? Awesome. Thank you very much. And I hope the rain hasn't uh, deafened the audio too much. 
Very good. See you next week. See you guys. Thank <laughs> you.